Good evening and welcome to the Harvard Law School Forum. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to mention that this Monday, November 18th at 8 p.m. here in Ames Courtroom, we will have Tom Wicker, columnist of the New York Times, speaking. Uh, the title of his speech is right now, The Politics Before Us. Now for tonight's guest. Arthur Lyman graduated from Harvard in 1954 and then graduated first in his class from Yale Law School in 1957. His legal career has been a mixture of private practice and public service. From 1961 to 65, he served as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And in 1965, he served as Special Assistant U.S. Attorney. In 1972, he was the Chief Counsel of the Special Commission investigating the prison uprising at Attica, which resulted in the deaths of close to 50 prisoners. More recently, he's headed the Legal Aid Society. Mr. Lyman gained particular national fame when in 1987 he served as chief counsel for the Senate on the investigation of mili military sales to Iran-Contra. More recently, he's headed the defense in the government's high-profile case against Michael Milken, the junk, the junk bond financier. Mr. Lyman presently is a partner at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. The topic of tonight's talk is, can congressional investigations be conducted fairly? Please welcome Mr. Arthur Lyman. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I envy you uh, for having uh, Tom Wicker uh, this coming week. Uh, he was one of the major figures in trying to avert the uh, Attica disaster, and we uh, became friends and have remained so since, and he has extraordinary insights into every subject he, uh, he speaks about. Uh, I uh, chose this, uh, this topic of uh, can congressional investigations be fair or I might say effective also in the light not just of the, uh, my own experiences in Iran-Contra but uh, on a more timely basis because of the frustration uh, that everybody had at the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings and particularly the, uh, uh, the uh, last round of those hearings. Uh, the, um, uh, the subject in my mind was, was framed by uh, a recent column that Meg Greenfield, the columnist for the Washington Post, uh, wrote for Newsweek and uh, Ms. Greenfield uh, said uh, that uh, she was very dissatisfied as everybody was with the outcome of the uh, Thomas hearings not just in terms of, of the confirmation but she was speaking about the fact that it ended in a uh, uh, almost a Rashomon like uh, uh, mood of nobody knowing uh, where truth lay and uh, she said that it was unfortunate uh, that this was not resolved uh, the way in which trials resolve issues and uh, divine truth and I thought about that uh, for a while and realized that uh, Meg Greenfield has probably never served on a jury and I hope she's never been a party in a litigation because it is a romantic view but it is essentially a myth that trials discover truth. Uh, Alan Dershowitz's uh, book and movie Reversal of Fortune uh, deliberately leave the uh, reader and the viewer with uncertainty as to whether Klaus von Bülow did it or did not do it. Um, the uh, Smith trial taking place in Palm Beach will produce a verdict or a hung jury, but whether the verdict is guilty or not guilty I don't think that 
those who watch it, and it will be shown gavel to gavel uh, on uh, court TV, will have a sense that the verdict speaks the truth. They'll form their own opinions, and they'll disagree or agree with the uh, with the uh, verdict. But it isn't going to be because the verdict has resolved it. It's because uh, you bring to um, to this process your common sense, your prejudices, your intuition, uh, uh, your own. Uh, uh, Judge Jerome Frank would say, you know, your your whole uh, uh, life's history and experiences uh, that, uh, uh, and so uh, it didn't surprise me that a congressional hearing should leave people in doubt as to whether Clarence Thomas was guilty of this charge or not. I think if, he, if this charge had been tried before a judge and jury, uh, there would still have been uh, doubt, uh, simply because we do not have any means of, uh, of resolving issues where it is in an effective way, where it is witness against witness, where the evidence is is divided and balanced. And yet, having said that, the, uh, the fact that this issue was aired the way it was in a congressional hearing left all of us with a very, at least speaking for myself, with a very uh, great sense of disquiet and a sense of unfairness and a sense that this is not uh, the way the system should operate. Uh, trials at least have trappings of due process. And because they have those trappings, because they have procedures that have been developed uh, over the centuries and refined uh, uh, year after year, uh, the verdicts are more easily accepted even if they do not represent an, uh, a truth in a scientific sense, but they're more easily accepted than the type of outcome uh, that we saw at the Thomas hearing. And I therefore thought that I would talk about congressional investigations. There has been a, a great deal of, um, of discussion and debate about whether they serve a purpose, about how uh, the process should be uh, reformed, and I ought to talk about it from my own uh, experience in Iran-Contra, because in Iran-Contra I was dealing with a question also for which we were doomed from the beginning not to find an answer that would satisfy anyone. And I... I uh, I say that uh, because uh, the uh, subject of our investigation was really a president. Uh, Congress didn't gear up this machinery. The independent council did not uh, uh, come into existence in order to investigate a lieutenant colonel. And what we we're all looking at, and whether we stated it express, expressly or whether it was implicit, was whether the President of the United States uh, had committed offenses, uh, whether uh, he should be removed from office. I mean, that was the heart of the issue. Everything else could have been handled in a more normal way. And yet, when you're dealing with a, uh, a president of the United States, you know from your own life's experience that the probability is that the people around the president will be protective. And because they will be protective, the chance of 
penetrating uh, uh, the, that, that cocoon that has been woven around him is very, very remote. You have to have a John Dean in the White House. And when I took the assignment, it was clear that what we had in the White House in the area that we were investigating were military officers. Admiral Poindexter was in a true sense uh, trained to go down with the ship. And I at least uh, uh, anticipated uh, from the day that uh, that I accepted the appointment, and I accepted it with, with reluctance in part for this reason, that uh, Admiral Poindexter would be protective of the president, whatever the truth was. And North also came from that same uh, environment. And McFarlane was also uh, a colonel in the Marines. And even if they had been civilians, there's a natural tendency to, uh, to uh, equate the president with the Constitution and to defend it with your body. In addition, uh, we knew when we started the investigation that we did not have the kind of smoking guns that existed in Watergate. There was no taping system in the White House, though every now and then uh, somebody writes a story that there must have been. There wasn't a taping system in the White House. And uh, many of the contemporaneous memos that were done at the time and that would normally give you not just an account of um, what happened, but give you some kind of access to what people were thinking to, to enable you to understand the motives, those all had been shredded, or at least the participants thought that they were all shredded. Some survived, but they didn't all survive. And you could assume that if a decision was made to shred, that the first documents that would get shredded would be the ones that might inculpate a president and that the ones that you would find would tend to be the ones that they didn't get to and, uh, or were sloppy about. So that the, uh, the odds of uh, cracking the case in a uh, Ellery Queen sense were always against uh, the, um, the committee. And uh, yet, it was an extraordinarily important thing for us to uh, conduct this investigation. And it was important to conduct it because so much of the uh, events of Iran-Contra had taken place in the darkness of night. Uh, there had been so much secrecy. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, so much of a cabal-like environment that it was critical to give the uh, American people a glimpse, even if it wasn't a full glimpse, of what happened and of who the participants were and to let people uh, make their own judgments. Now, for me, uh, the investigation of this affair dealing with covert operations was really the third investigation that I had conducted into a closed institution. The first was Attica, which was the first uh, investigation uh, into a prison in which we the investigators had full uh, access to the, uh, uh, the uh, prison, the prisoners, the, the keepers. Uh, there had never been anything like the uh, Attica uprising or anything like the Attica investigation before. And we did part of it uh, on television. And 
uh, Attica had the Attica investigation, the report by the McKay Commission had very, very significant effects on uh, reform movements and sentencing and parole in, uh, in prison administration uh, because it allowed people to, to see for the first time uh, with their own eyes in, a, in an electronic era uh, what these institutions were like. And it also investigated the coroner's office in New York, which is a, understandably a, a closed institution in which the public knew very little about and which really needed to have the, uh, the spotlight put on it. And, uh, and now I was investigating the um, whole national uh, security apparatus operating in a, uh, in a covert uh, operation. And in many ways, I think I was misled by the um, prior experiences because an investigation uh, conducted by a blue ribbon committee headed by Robert McKay, uh, who was dean of NYU Law School, and with members like Burke Marshall, is a very different kind of body than conducting an investigation for a political institution like the Congress of the United States. Uh, we tried in the, um, in the uh, at, in the Iran-Contra investigation to observe some due process. I say some, you never can do it totally, but we tried. Uh, there was a sense by all of the members of that committee that uh, the fact that the executive had breached uh, its powers uh, should not give the Congress license to abuse, abuse its own, that it would be almost the ultimate irony and tragedy of Iran-Contra if an abuse by one branch just led to an abuse by another. And nobody wanted to conduct a McCarthy-like investigation. And I was appointed to head the Senate committee and the Senate committee made decisions that were very, very different uh, from the Thomas hearing. Uh, the Senate committee decided that uh, it would have a council who represented both the majority and the minority so that there would not be a polarization on the staff between majority members and minority members and the role of counsel was through in the Senate side was to try to conduct a professional investigation and to keep the, the, um, the hearings from uh, turning into this kind of, of spectacle that we saw a month ago and uh, it meant, therefore, that I regarded um, all members of the committee from um, uh, left to right as my uh, clients. And it meant that there was a, a covenant that they made that they would not try to, to uh, demagogue it up uh, during the hearings and that we would try to stick to the issue at the hearings of what happened. Now, it didn't, we couldn't carry that out, and I'll explain why, but that was what the goal was. Let's not have hearings on whether Contra policy was good or bad, because if you got into the issue of whether you should support the Contras or not support the uh, Contras, that all that you'd have is speeches. And you'd never be able to have hearings that, that dealt with the facts of what happened. Uh, it was too uh, divisive an issue. Indeed, on the Senate side, a majority of the members of the Democrats on this committee, as well as all of the Republicans, had supported Contra Aid and had opposed the Bowen Amendment. So it was hardly even a, a, um, a fair split. So the idea was, let's try to do this investigation 
as fact-finding and avoid the more partisan uh, issues that would uh, polarize a committee. Uh, and that was an, um, an important uh, agreement that I think you have to have if you're going to, to conduct hearings in a way in which uh, people have some sense uh, that uh, it's uh, that, that people care about what really happened. Uh, Congress isn't set up to be a court. There's nobody there who can sit in the middle and rule. And uh, therefore, uh, the model for a congressional investigation, I would say, uh, is more the uh, inquisitorial, the magistrate method of the continent than the adversarial uh, system uh, the, of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. And that's the way we looked upon this investigation, that every witness would be subjected to examination and cross-examination. And if Oliver North said that he told the president he'd be subjected to as much cross-examination as uh, if he said he didn't tell the president. It was to be straight down the middle. Now, it didn't work that way. We, we can I'll come to that. But uh, those were the aspirations of this uh, investigation. And um, it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, uh, Senator Inouye, who chaired the uh, Iran-Contra hearing, uh, was a veteran of the Irvin Watergate investigation. Now, the Irvin Committee in Watergate uh, is regarded as being a very, very successful congressional committee. Many people credit it uh, for the uh, ultimate impeachment of uh, President Nixon. Uh, what was not known to anyone other than those people who are on the inside, like, like in a way, uh, was that it was an extraordinarily partisan group the uh, majority staff and the minority staff spent most of their time spying on one another. Uh, they spent so much time spying on one another that they never uh, issued any subpoenas or, or requests that would have called for tapes, and that they discovered the tapes toward the end of the investigation by accident. So that, that the, uh, the, met the, the uh, adversarial method that was typical for congressional investigations almost led uh, to the tapes uh, not being uh, found and produced. It was the result of a witness volunteering their existence in public hearings and uh, in a way thought that the hearings led to the glorification of, uh, of Sam Irvin, but that they really weren't designed to get at whatever you could. Uh, the, um, the other uh, uh, decision that was made by the Iran-Contra committees was that the investigation should be done privately and that the public hearings really should be held to exhibit what you had found much the way a trial uh, exhibits the evidence that each side has already discovered and marshaled that uh, you weren't going to use public hearings to put witnesses on totally green and just wander around and that we shouldn't have an investigation in which you give each uh, member of the committee, the Senate or you know, the House, 10 minutes and then the next member gets 10 minutes, no questions get followed up. The result is that uh, you end up with more confusion than what you started with. And the theory was initially that the staff should do the whole investigation uh, in executive session, do it privately, and that at the uh, end of that process there would be public hearings and that the members of the committee themselves would, would conduct the hearings, you'd appoint one or two Democrats and Republicans for each witness, uh, a system that was tried in the uh, Clarence Thomas uh, hearings, but which didn't work there and which 
was abandoned in our investigation because the subject was too complex and uh, the uh, members of the committee realized very quickly that there was no way that they could conduct a coherent examination of the witnesses. They were better off coming in and asking pointed questions on the basis of what they had already heard uh, than to try to uh, do an examination from scratch. And so that was the way in which we set it up. It was set up, uh, in that sense, the way in which you would set up a trial. Do your preparation first, examine your witnesses uh, in your office, uh, and then uh, uh, call those who have something important to say and uh, uh, lead them directly into relevant areas of, of testimony, uh, develop the testimony in a thematic way so that the public can understand it, uh, and try to, to uh, have a have hearings that would uh, serve a didactic purpose uh, and not just a political purpose, and that I think was the goal. The other other decisions that were made by the committee that are are um, taken for granted today, but I can assure you that any uh, student of congressional investigations uh, would tell you it was an exception, not the rule was that we would not call any witness solely for the purpose of having the wit in public session, solely for the purpose of having the witness invoke the Fifth Amendment. Uh, Senator McCarthy and others of, of his generation, Senator Munt, uh, had uh, the House on American Activities Committee, had perfected to an art uh, this business of calling witnesses in public sessions, knowing that they were going to take the Fifth Amendment, and then asking them loaded questions, uh, and just getting the um, uh, uh, Fifth Amendment responses one after another. So that here you could have said, you could have put Poindexter on and said, well, Admiral Poindexter, isn't it a fact that you uh, told the uh, President all about the diversion? I refuse to answer on the ground that the answer may tend to incriminate me, uh, that isn't it true that the President ordered you to cover up the diversion, I refuse to answer, and, and you could have done that uh, for uh, an hour, and by the time you finished, half the country would have believed that, the, uh, that uh, his answers really were acknowledgments that the President was guilty, which he may have been, but that that's what he was saying. Uh, the other half would have been at your, your, your throat for using the McCarthy technique. And the committee said, no, it didn't want any part of that. So every witness who was called in public session and who planned to take the Fifth Amendment had already uh, received an order of immunity and they just went through the uh, initial question in which they had to invoke their privilege and immediately after that we would give the immunity uh, formally and the uh, testimony would be given. Uh, we respected attorney-client privilege. We respected uh, doctor-patient privilege. I didn't see the difference between the Ellsberg break-in and, uh, and demanding uh, the uh, medical records of, uh, of North uh, uh, for his treatment in, uh, 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 by uh, doctors or psychiatrists in the Pentagon. He was entitled to his privacy and uh, the, uh, the right wing which has adopted him as a hero may not believe in the right of privacy but we were not hypocritical and we did believe in the right of privacy and we respected those things. And so there was a, a um, uh, an effort at trying uh, to, to be uh, fair uh, the process broke down with us the same way it broke down in the Clarence Thomas hearings. What happened in the Iran-Contra hearings was that the Senate's hearings had to be merged with the House's hearings. The House did not have this kind of agreement among its members that they would try to conduct the hearing in a less partisan manner. Uh, for the House committee, it was business as usual. 
and that meant that for the Republican members of the House Committee, this was an, an, a soapbox uh, to uh, blast the Congress for having adopted the Bolin Amendment and an opportunity to speak about democracy in Nicaragua and uh, that uh, they were going to, to uh, engage in that kind of speech making at every opportunity. And once they began doing it, it meant that members of the Senate committee like Orrin Hatch uh, had an irresistible temptation to join in. And those of you who watched uh, 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 the Clarence uh, Thomas hearings and saw Senator Hatch really know that he's very, very good at, uh, at making these kinds of speeches. And so that once our hearings began, the agreement fell apart. And uh, the, uh, that, uh, and there was a degree of, um, of politic politicization that we wanted to avoid. It wasn't overwhelming. Uh, uh, Representative Hamilton and Senator Inouye try to control it, but uh, it did have an effect on the hearings and it blurred what we were trying to accomplish. The other thing, of course, that happened was Oliver North. Uh, Oliver North uh, came to these hearings and, um, and he just sort of electrified the country. Now, I tell you that as a trial lawyer, uh, what you would have done with an Oliver North at a hearing was to let Oliver North talk for a day and two days and three days and four days and you know by the third or fourth day it would have been like Captain Queeg. There would have been a, a, a self destruct and and I'm not uh, I don't mean this in a uh, in a mean way because uh, I think Oliver North uh, has the capacity to to believe everything he says uh, but uh, it's uh, people would have started to see through it and they'd ultimately start laughing at it but the object was to keep him on the stand long enough. And what happened, uh, and incidentally, his lawyer, who's a very good lawyer, Brendan Sullivan, who you all saw, knew that, uh, that uh, this would happen to, to North if he was kept on too long. He bargained for us to keep him on for no longer than five days, but we could have kept him on for more than five days. We kept him on as it is for only three and a half days. And uh, the, uh, what happened was that we divided witnesses between the House and the Senate. Uh, uh, the House counsel had uh, North, I had Poindexter, and the House counsel was a very able lawyer by the name of John Neils, very, very able. And uh, John, led off with uh, with Oliver North and uh, he was taken by surprise and uh, North kept making these speeches. Now the speeches, if you just read them, were extraordinary admissions. They're no different from the book today which, which has been billed as having you know, lots of discoveries his book is essentially a rearrangement of his testimony to put it in a in, in a different uh, order. But uh, he made speech after speech, all of which had an effect of saying, "I am the patriot. Uh, that I was fighting for democracy. Congress was." a leaking agency, Congress was, a, was 
frustrating efforts to achieve democracy. I am the fall guy. Congress is now making me into the scapegoat. And the telegrams started to uh, pour in. And they poured in, and they poured in. And in fact, they, they, they were given a subsidy to come in because Western Union, uh, seeing a good thing, decided that it would provide a special rate for anyone who sent a, uh, a, uh, a, a uh, form telegram to Oliver North or to the committee saying, we support Oliver North, and if you wanted to send a, a telegram supporting the committee, it was four times the rate. And so, so uh, it, it, I guess justified on volume discounts, the, 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 the result was that this uh, political body, the United States Congress, was there getting uh, this mountain of telegrams saying, why are you picking on Oliver North? Why don't you vote him the uh, Congressional uh, uh, Medal of Honor? And John kept going and going and going, and I was waiting for my turn. And by the time my turn came, I had, we had a committee uh, uh, of uh, 11 members, right, Sam? Sam Hirsch was on my uh, staff. And we had a, a committee of 11 members, and then there were 15 members of the House and all of the Democratic members and some of the moderate Republicans were audibly praying, please, Arthur, don't cross-examine him. Get him off the stand. I mean, they were, they were, they were almost literally in trauma that uh, a uh, confrontation with Oliver North would lead to all of them uh, uh, losing the next election. And uh, the, uh, the result was that uh, uh, we, uh, you know, I got him off the stand. I covered what I wanted to do with him. And then I had a whole volume of questions which had been prepared for the members to ask to fill in the blanks. And as I recall it, not one member of the committee, this group of uh, 26, was willing to ask him a question. They all made speeches. Most of them made speeches saying that he was a great hero. It's just too bad he didn't understand the Constitution. Those who were on the uh, uh, Democratic side said he didn't understand the uh, Curtis Wright decision as if that's what the hearings were all about. And uh, so uh, Congress uh, backed off of in, in being able to, uh, to uh, have a, you know, a fuller uh, airing of what Oliver North had to say. And uh, he left really at the height of his testimony and I therefore could sympathize uh, with uh, the um, uh, with those of us who uh, who felt that uh, the um, Clarence Thomas hearings were unfair to Anita Hill, and that I think that the same kind of fear uh, gripped the Democratic majority of that committee. Uh, I'll give you my analysis of it. Uh, I don't know whether anybody on the committee is capable of, of this kind of self-analysis himself. I don't have to say himself or herself in this case. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, those like Senator Specter who saw their role as the defender of Clarence Thomas had no fear of being embarrassed. They had absolutely no fear of being embarrassed because they knew that whatever the evidence was,
Clarence Thomas was going to go to his grave saying he didn't do it. And so they therefore felt very, very comfortable in uh, conducting a vigorous and, in my opinion, an unseemly examination uh, of, uh, of her making speeches. It was not, you know, whatever people may say about our investigation, we never descended to those depths. We try to maintain principle, and we kept it in a what, what I think was a dignified way. We, you know that 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 no amount of provocation, and there were provocations directed at me personally, could lead me to respond in kind. And the uh, this committee on the Republican side did things that you wouldn't do in magistrates' court. Because if you did it in magistrates' court, the jury would find against your client. I mean, it was a the 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 um, uh, there was almost an, 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 in my view a deliberate intent not to understand what she was saying on some subjects, uh, and then representing what she said as being perjurious when it wasn't. Uh, the Democrats, on the other hand, were seized with fear that if they defended her too uh, strongly, and if it turned out that there was something in her past that would come up, that she was a fantasizer, that she had made charges against other people there, they didn't have control of the witness. They didn't know that there was a, a fear of the unknown that they would be out on the limb. And so they, therefore, occupied sort of a neutral role. They were judicious uh, in their questioning. And when you had this kind of self-restraint on one side, while you had bullying on the other side, the outcome was almost inevitable. And uh, the, uh, there, were, there were some, some great moments when Biden did rise to the occasion at, in, in one speech he gave at the end. But the notion that a candidate for the United States Supreme Court should have been allowed to virtually unchallenged make statements about conspiracy against him and that that itself should not have been a subject of concern and questioning by the members uh, was to me uh, sort of the, the ultimate uh, uh, proof, the demonstrative evidence of the failure of the process of that committee. They also didn't ask follow-up questions with respect to her. None of us knows whether she acknowledges that Clarence Thomas uh, went to her apartment or didn't go to her apartment. It's sort of a basic question. If you're going to go into these hearings, at least answer that question. But it, it wasn't answered. And the result was that once the polls came in, and particularly the polls in the southern states, and showed that the constituents there wanted Clarence Thomas uh, confirmed whether or not he was guilty of, of sexual harassment, the hearings uh, result was foreordained. Now, why did it have to be that way? Well, uh, I think that, and, and, and here there's a degree of speculation, uh, the proper way to have conducted the, this aspect of the uh, Clarence Thomas hearings uh, was in executive session. In fact, those hearings got all convoluted. In public session, they didn't insist on answers to questions which they should have had the right to have before confirming somebody for life. 
And this was not a blank slate like, like David Souter. This is a person who had spoken on a subject, and you were, since he had spoken on a subject, entitled to find out whether it still reflected his, his views, and if it didn't reflect his views, and what way they had changed. Those questions were all off bounds. They weren't asked so that the public sessions didn't ask the questions that were relevant for a confirmation, and the, private se the public sessions explored subjects that would have been more comfortably uh, uh, exposed, at least in the beginning, in private. And we stripped away her privacy, and we, we stripped away the privacy of a lot of other witnesses, and we were racing against the clock, and we had the public opinion polls, and we had inept questioning, and we had no staff and no professional examiners except the former DA on, uh, on the Republican side. And it was really a bad show for Congress. Now, let me come back to our hearings. Um, I am very, very uh, mindful of the fact that as a result of our giving immunity to Oliver North, uh, he um, had his conviction dismissed and uh, And therefore, the question is, um, is often put to me, uh, was it worth it? When you're a participant in the decision to give immunity, uh, you become introspective as to whether all you're doing is rationalizing your own mistakes. I don't think I'm doing that. I think it was worth it. I think that, that what I would say to you is that the, um, if the decision, if the choice was whether Oliver North should have had 1,200 hours of community service, which is what I think he got, or 800 hours, and Poindexter should have gotten a year in jail, that's one choice. And as part of that choice, we would not have had the, uh, uh, the picture of what was knowable about Iran-Contra until five years after the event, until Oliver North wrote his book. Then I say that it was better to air the subject at the time and it was more important that we try to find out at the time in a public forum in which people could have confidence that they were at least seeing the witnesses and being able to form their own opinions as to what happened and whether the president was responsible. And we did not prove in an impeachment sense that the president had uh, directed the cover-up or that he was uh, the person uh, who was knowledgeable about the diversion. But those who watched television and watched Poindexter's explanation of why he didn't tell the president could not have easily believed Poindexter's story. And if you accept the fact that some uh, stories have to be left at least in part to inference, then I think that the American people did get from our hearings that story. I at least came away from the hearings convinced that the president was responsible. And before we had those hearings, the public record of Iran-Contra had been written by the Tower Board. And the Tower Board was an accomplished commission. 
It operated behind closed doors and it couldn't give immunity. And the picture it portrayed, that it presented, was one of a distant, remote president whose biggest mistake was appointing Donald Reagan as his chief of staff, George Shultz as his secretary of state, and Cap Weinberger as his secretary of defense, and who did not know what was happening. The picture that emerged from our public hearings was that when it came to the decision to sell arms to Iran or to uh, continue to arm the Contras, he was a hands-on president. It was his policy. It was his decision. And even though Poindexter said he never told him about the diversion, he also said that was consistent with his general marching orders, and it was. I think he told him about the diversion, but that's irrelevant. We didn't prove that. I think that, that you know, the Iran-Contra affair was Ronald Reagan's affair. He was at the center of it, and people who watched the hearings understood it. And indeed, the sympathy for North was sympathy because he was seen as a fall guy. And when Oliver North said in his book, and it got headlines, that he believed that the president knew about the diversion, people forgot. That's what he testified in our hearings, that he believed that the president knew about it. Before North testified, there was a mythology that he is a, a lieutenant colonel who went off on an escapade on his own. He was the loose cannon. And he said no. Everything he did was authorized by McFarlane and Poindexter. And Poindexter confirmed that. And so we got a great deal of the story out. And if you believe that there are some offenses in uh, government that aren't defined by the United States Code, if you believe that the courts are not the answer to every abuse of power in the way in which we govern ourselves, if you believe in what Brandeis said so many years ago, that in a democracy sunlight is the best disinfectant, then I believe that our hearings were the only disinfectant such as it was. Today, Five years after the uh, story of Iran-Contra was broken by that Lebanese newspaper, the Independent Council's work is still not finished. His report is probably a year from completion. Uh, by the time the report uh, is, uh, is issued, uh, the people are going to be bored with what happened. There will be a footnote in history. And given the fact that what we were dealing with, in my opinion, was not so much a war against the Sandinistas, but a war against Congress, it was imperative that if Congress took seriously its role in foreign policy, that it conduct its own investigation, that it uh, present publicly what happened. And if the price, as the uh, D.C. Circuit said in a ruling that's unprecedented in its breadth, if, if, if the price was that Oliver North uh, will have his right to vote restored, then so be it. I think 
that in a difficult area, in a matter where you have to do balancing, that the scales tipped in favor of disclosure. I would say that those who, who take the opposite view often assume that we would know exactly today what we do know without the immunity. They, they just take for granted things that came out only because of the grant of immunity and then say, why did you give it? And it's easy to understand why, because it's hard to separate what the sources of your knowledge are. And all that I can say to that is that if we had frozen our knowledge with the tower board, or if our knowledge was only what you got under the very restrictive rules of evidence in the North case, he would have known a lot about the tin cup in which he allegedly kept his money you would have known a lot less about how this affair happened. And Poindexter, I would remind you, has yet to testify publicly in any proceeding but our own because he refused to testify at his own trial. So that's, um, uh, you know, those are, are uh, my sort of off-the-cuff views on, on uh, congressional investigations. Um, there are lots of things I would have done differently. Uh, there are lots of things that I'm sure others who come after me and conduct these investigations will do differently. They will always have a political restraint. And another word for political restraint, I guess, is democracy and that the Congress has to be responsive and uh, you have to accept those limitations. I thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions. <laughs> On any subject. Questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Lyman, one of the more interesting people to appear during your investigation was a graduate of this law school, Elliot Abrams. Right. I wonder if you have any uh, reflections on how the old uh, Elliot Abrams affair, I guess which finally ended last month when he pled guilty to uh, two misdemeanors. Well, I, I don't know how many of you remember his appearance uh, at our hearings. Uh, he was shredded at our hearings for the very uh, dissembling that he was indicted for. And uh, the, um, you know, I just, uh, one of my, my reactions is, uh, what's wrong with our criminal justice system if five years after we knew that he had engaged in, uh, in this conduct, a decision is made to indict him. Now, you know, he could have been indicted for these events five years ago. Uh, the other aspect of it is, um, is, is uh, I think, um, uh, I'll be um, a little uh, more uh, introspective about it myself. Uh, I believe that, that virtually everybody caught up in the Iran-Contra affair was a casualty of a decision that the president made. And that doesn't mean that they don't bear responsibility for it, but it, be, but it means that you have to evaluate what they did in that context. Presidents, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, have enormous power. They inspire extraordinary allegiance. People who work for presidents confuse them uh, with the Constitution. There are exceptions. Uh, Cy Vance, when he disagreed with, with uh, Carter, resigned. Uh, Clark Clifford stood up to ultimately to Johnson on the Vietnam War. But they were powerful people. 
Uh, most people who work for, for presidents have almost a groupy attitude. It's the only president they've ever worked for. He's their president. He gives them power, and uh, they, uh, uh, they exercise no independent judgment. When this president decided that he was going to publicly uh, proclaim that he was adhering to the Bolin Amendment, while at the same time circumventing it secretly, and when he announced that he was following a policy of not trafficking with terrorists while selling them on secretly in order to get hostages back, the, he, he made it almost impossible for the people around him to be honest with themselves, let alone with Congress and with others. Alan Fires, who's uh, the CIA uh, uh, official who pled guilty recently and is cooperating with the Independent Council, testified before us that he felt that he was in a giant nutcracker. Uh, we had uh, military officers, decent people who worked in Central America, who were torn between allegiances to the White House and their own sense of, of uh, it being wrong to, to lie. But when you have a secret policy, then of course there's going to be a big, big lie, unless people have the courage to say, we won't talk about it. And when they're called before Congress, as Elliot Abrams was, to have the sense enough to say, I'm claiming executive privilege. Instead, uh, every one of the officials who came before Congress in the, before the investigation, before the story broke, dissembled. Now, I don't think that Oliver North, if he had not worked for this administration, would have been a lawbreaker. I don't think that, that, that he had that kind of flaw in his character, and certainly that's not true you know, of, of uh, Poindexter. Poindexter would have served out his career in the Navy in an, in an honorable way. He would have headed the Sixth Fleet. He would have retired. Uh, uh, he's a man who refused to wear his uniform when he testified because he took the Annapolis Honor Code and the First Commandment in the Honor Code is thou shalt not lie, and he somehow had convinced himself that when he wore the uniform, he was a naval officer and therefore bound by the code, and when he didn't wear the uniform, he was a political official in the Reagan administration and free to do whatever politicians do, which may include lying. And you never could get uh, Admiral Poindexter to wear his, his uniform when he testified. I had him testify six times privately. I could never get Admiral Poindexter to, uh, to uh, wear his uniform. Admiral Poindexter will go to his grave and see his makeup and say, I never lied under, you know, in, in uniform. And, uh, and, you know, and, and now I, we, we used to give nicknames to, to uh, uh, these uh, officials, and my nickname for Admiral Poindexter was Billy Budd, because uh, and I just felt that he was, he was going to uh, go off the gangplank, uh, you know, thanking the uh, captain for having given him the opportunity to serve. And uh, uh, that, that you took people who, who you know, chose a life of public service or military service, which is a form of public service, or CIA, and who ended up destroying their careers, not being able to face their, their uh, wives and children, having all of this disgrace because of a decision of one man that uh, the, uh, that he would show his contempt for Congress uh, in the way in which he conducted his policies. And incidentally, I saw the Iran-Contra affair in a much broader context. 
I mean, to me, what happened in the Iran-Contra affair was not much different from impoundment of funds that had been appropriated and authorized by Congress. There, it was not, not different in my mind from saying, well, Congress won't abolish the Legal Services Corporation, so what I will do is that I will make interim appointments of people who are hostile to the Legal Services Corporation and put them on the board of the Legal Services Corporation. And there was an absolutely total contempt of, of Congress in that administration. And the, uh, the functionaries, in many instances, got caught in the middle. Some didn't. Uh, Abe Sofair, and I don't remember whether Abe went to this uh, uh, law school, didn't. He threatened to resign. George Schultz didn't. But a lot of the others did, and, and they are casualties of, of the uh, uh, Reagan uh, uh, policy. And, uh, and you know, I can understand the rage of an Oliver North that, that he ventilates in this book that the president has yet to, to do what you'd expect the commander-in-chief to do, the statute of limitations has run, and said they were following my orders, uh, let them off, it was me. I mean, I, you, you have to ask yourself, I mean, what, what kind of administration was this in which the, the um, uh, the subordinates were expected to serve the prison time. And I reread Oliver North's testimony after I uh, read his book. And what he, what he, when I questioned him in the, the little time that I had, what he said was that I was prepared to be the fall guy for, for political purposes when they announced that it was going to be a criminal investigation, that was when that role ended for me. And, and I think that, you know, it was extraordinary. I and mean, uh, when, when Oliver North initially resigned, Poindexter indicated he knew nothing about the diversion. He had authorized it. I mean, they were all prepared to let the lowest person take the responsibility to keep it away from the president. And so, you know, when I think of Elliot Abrams, uh, there, I also look upon him as a person who has an element of, uh, of being at the wrong working for the wrong president at the wrong time in what happened to him. But I do believe very much in the, you know, in the rule of law, and uh, I believe that a graduate of this law school ought to know that you don't lie. Yes. Well, and yet the uh, uh, speaker or the senator or whoever, at the time that they question, they, they, they seem almost to be expecting that people would be just uh, shocked by his conduct. Well, I, I, I don't know if there was a recognition that maybe most people do not understand the subtlety of, of the policy violations that might well, have taken place. And well, I think that's what, that was part of the problem when, when the hearings turned into a debate over the policy. Uh, if we could have presented this the way a documentary
filmmaker could make a documentary, then what I would say to you was that you can disagree with a law, but if the, you're the president or you're in the administration, you're sworn to uphold it. And that's why I didn't want to get into whether the Bowen Amendment was good policy or bad policy. It was the law. And there are lots of laws I disagree with, but they're, you know, that you're obligated to enforce them and carry them out. And they did just the opposite. Now, you're right. When it came to the Bowen Amendment, the country was evenly split. Every poll showed that the country was evenly split on the Bowen Amendment. And uh, therefore, uh, I think there was a sense, well, so what? That, uh, that people circumvented the Bolin Amendment. There was a different attitude about selling arms to uh, the Ayatollah. I think there, uh, there's probably 80% of the people were appalled by it. And uh, the, um, you know, I'll tell you where I got that information. The President of the United States uh, did polls every week on the uh, Contra policy, and he was frustrated by it, and he would confide in his diaries, his frustration, that he couldn't understand um, why he could not, with his weekly radio addresses, get a majority of the country to support the Contras. And when I say evenly split, I mean, I'm not trying to be precise whether it's 50-50, it could have been 35 65 one week, 40, 60, 55, 45. The Congress itself mirrored the vacillation of, of the country on this issue. It was not an issue that, that in which there was a clear consensus uh, in the country. Well, it depends what, how you frame the question. You see, if, if, you, if the question was, do you want to get into another Vietnam, then it was probably 90% that were for the Bolin Amendment. If the question was, do you want to withdraw the support from this ragtag band of conchers, then you got a percentage that was quite different. It was a matter of, of what were you doing and how people saw, whether people saw it as a first step or as a last step. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at Congress in some ways as a barometer of, uh, of public opinion, uh, the Congress was constantly going back and forth on the Bowen Amendment, and it only lasted a little over a year. I mean, with, with, by September of, of um, 1986, we were back to military uh, aid. We were earlier back to, uh, to humanitarian aid, which Senator Kennedy pointed out was a euphemism for providing uh, uh, field supplies, rations, uh, uniforms. So. Uh, the, uh, it was an issue on which I think that, that there was not a consensus. But it might, my point wouldn't have mattered in terms of whether it was 70 percent, 30, 60, 40. The fact is that it was a law. The president didn't do what Roosevelt did. When Roosevelt wanted to sell destroyers, he did it openly. He said, I'm exercising my presidential prerogative. When Truman sees the steel mills seize the steel mills, that here you had a president who purported to, to uh, be complying with a uh, law that he signed. He didn't veto it. He signed it. And at the same time was uh, uh, working underground uh, as if it didn't exist. And I think that was what's intolerable in a democracy.
uh, and that's what gives you the fear of, you know, is there a secret government and can you trust government and, and do laws uh, uh, bind the executive branch. The other part of, the, of your question was, you know, did, were people bothered by things? If you could have presented that documentary, I think people are bothered by a cover-up. I mean, that, that's incidentally true. Just in even small uh, e events, normal criminal cases, it's always the cover-up that's worse than the underlying event. And the cover-up here was revolting. Yes, sir. No, because no. No, I. Oh no, I was just talking about the, the. Uh, more or less the choreography of a hearing as to why in the case of a Oliver North, uh, he, uh, uh, the committee could not press forward with all of the questions it should have. The reason that the committee did not get to the President of the United States was that the evidence did not exist for us any more than it exists for the independent counsel who's had five years to develop his case. The fact of the matter is that there is not a single document that uh, inculpates the president and that the only witnesses who could have inculpated him all said that he either did not know or that they did not tell him. So it was a case in which you did not have the evidence. Now in a parliamentary system, uh, the fact that the president was so heavily involved and that you could draw inferences about the fact that he set in motion the whole process would have been enough to bring the government down. We don't have a system of votes of no confidence, as you, as you know. And so in order to bring a president down in this country, it has got to be based on, on an impeachment process of... Uh, high crimes and misdemeanors, and no matter how you define that, it was something more than either we or the independent counsel could establish. The evidence was just not there, and unless we were going to rewrite the Constitution, you could not possibly have brought the um, a, uh, impeachment proceeding. Poindexter, when he uh, covered the president with his body, uh, ended uh, that whole uh, inquiry. There was no way of getting past him. No. Uh, the, uh, there's no evidence now. The, um, uh, all of the roads led to uh, to. Poindexter, I mean, North in his book, in which he, as I say, he ventilates his anger, says no more than what he said in our hearings, which is that he always believed the president knew, but he never told him. Nobody ever said to him that they had told the president. It was an assumption on his part that the president would have been told. And, uh, and so he never met with the president alone, and the president was never told in his presence. The only person alive uh, who uh, uh, could answer that question is uh, Admiral Poindexter, and he has answered it, and he's not going to change that testimony. And his answer has been that the president was not told of the diversion, nor did the president order a cover-up. So uh, the, um, uh, you know, there was no John Dean in this administration. Yes? No. Uh, 
I mean, I think that the, uh, there's more criticism that I've heard the other way, that he didn't have a thirst to get the president. I think that, that um, the, uh, there was an honest effort to try to get the facts, but you have to say, what are the facts? And were we conducting an investigation into everything that every person who was in government did in the Iran-Contra affair? And the answer is no. Uh, if you don't have a select committee of Congress that conducts that kind of investigation. What we were doing was we were conducting an investigation into the central events with a focus on whether the President of the United States was the person who was responsible for uh, the, uh, the cover-up, for the diversion, and for events that weren't criminal but were significant, such as the decision to sell arms to Iran and the decision to continue to support the Contras. And uh, it wasn't an effort to get the president. And there was no, I did not detect on the part of any member of that committee a uh, hunger to get uh, the president. He was immensely popular, and I detected an enormous sense of self restraint uh, about uh, whether to. Uh, uh, Know how far to go, but there were no rest restrictions put on me, and I can assure you that if Admiral Poindexter or, or North or a document or somebody else had inculpated the president, that there would have been an impeachment. Uh, you know, we saw hundreds of witnesses. We examined hundreds of thousands of documents. We did a computer dump where you got bits of words and sentences. Uh, the independent counsel described the president in his first indictment of North as a victim, somebody who was betrayed by North. Uh, the, um, uh, he's never been, uh, been considered a target of the independent counsel's investigation because he found no more evidence than we did. And he had more power than we did because he had the power to indict and to, to use that power to uh, obtain cooperation. You know, the, uh, there are some events that you just have to leave for history. And uh, that uh, you can call all the witnesses in the world and uh, you be the judge. Do you believe that a professional naval officer who never in his life uh, uh, put his commander-in-chief at risk or his commander at risk would all of a sudden make the momentous decision to authorize a diversion and not get permission first? Do you believe that he would do that knowing that if the diversion came out that the whole administration could be rocked with scandal? And do you believe that, that if it was as simple as that, that he would have taken the Fifth Amendment from day one? Uh, here's a, here's a uh, admiral who, as soon as the scandal broke, the first thing he did was he tore up the only copy of the presidential order that uh, uh, described the uh, sales to Iran as an arms for hostage sale. And when asked uh, by me as to why he did it, he said to protect the president. To protect him from what? To protect him from political embarrassment. So clearly the, uh, the you know, Admiral Poindexter saw this, said he saw it as one of his duties to protect the president politically. And if he had told the president, he would have said he didn't. And of course, if he didn't tell the president, he would say he didn't. And you have to make your own judgment as to whether you think this military officer did this on his own. 
the person who knew him best, McFarland, said under oath, just volunteering his opinion, that it was inconceivable that he could do it on his own. Oliver North clearly, not just by his words, but by his actions, uh, indicated that he believed that Poindexter had told the president. So if Poindexter didn't tell the president, he took on more responsibility for an act that was stupid than he ever did for any act in his whole tenure there. But, you know, you have to make those judgments that, that uh, there wasn't a proof to impeach. Yes? How was it? Uh, you're, you're not talking about Felix Rodriguez because he wasn't indicted. You mean uh, Jose uh, the, uh, Joe Fernandez? Well, he wasn't. He wasn't indicted because I, I guess that the independent counsel didn't feel he had the case. He did indict. What? No, no, you, I, I, let, me, let me just... I, I, you're thinking of something that you have a right to be disgusted about, but I think you have the wrong name, okay? okay. Uh, there was a, a CIA station chief in Costa Rica who was indicted in Virginia by the name of Joe Fernandez. And his case was dismissed because the... Uh, Attorney General refused to release the classified documents. Look, I believe that the... Um, well, I don't... big question, but let me just answer it first, and then I'll get to you second. I think that, that uh, the Justice Department um, under Thornburg was an intensely political uh, Justice Department, and I cannot understand a principled basis for withholding the records in the Fernandez trial. Uh, the, that isn't to say that that uh, now that I necessarily agree that the way to have gone about it was to indict some station chief in uh, in Costa Rica while everybody else is uh, is getting away with it. But the fact is, he was indicted, and the attorney general withheld evidence and therefore killed that indictment. And I thought that that was an absolutely outrageous decision. On the October surprise, you know, you've, you've read uh, the New Republic on it, you've read Newsweek. I, you know, my view on it is this, that, that uh, clearly Casey uh, had uh, a motive to do something to defer the release of the hostages. But that's like, um, again, an Agatha Christie story where everybody from the, uh, the butler on up has a motive to commit the offense. The question is whether Casey had the opportunity to do it. Uh, did anyone from the Iranian administration in power uh, somebody with authority ever make contact with him so that he could make a deal. And there, the proof at the very best is equivocal, 
And now at worst, it's either incredible or dubious. Uh, the first person to challenge the proof was a person who had no motive to challenge the proof. It was Lloyd Cutler, who was President Carter's counsel, and who wrote a very, very uh, forceful op-ed piece in the New York Times, uh, taking apart the sick theory. Uh, I have... My, my sense of it is this, and I don't know, you know the, the only thing I know about it is because it was outside of our mandate, is that uh, we, uh, we took a peek at one little part of it because it was irresistible, and that is that one of the um, Iranians uh, uh, passed word that George Bush was in Paris on a particular date and that that's when the October surprise deal was made. And so we uh, got the Secret Service records and we also got the records of, uh, of what he was being covered on on that day uh, by journalists. And they, the, the, uh, as I recalled it, the date that was picked was a date that was blank in the official calendar, but he actually it was not a date that he had disappeared. The journalists were there covering him, the Secret Service was there covering him, and he wasn't in Paris. And so, you know, that was dismissed. Now the theory has shifted to the fact that it wasn't George Bush, but that it was, um, it was Casey in Madrid. Uh, we didn't give immunity to Gabonafar or to any of the, uh, the Iranian middlemen not just because they uh, failed to pass a single question on a lie detector test, because I don't really believe lie detector tests, but because the, uh, the stories kept changing on, in, in our own area all the time, and we didn't find anybody that you could trust at all. And I think that if uh, the, the House and the Senate have been quietly, certainly the House, have been quietly looking at this subject since Gary Sick uh, wrote his piece. And it's inconceivable to me that if they found something that really stuck, that they wouldn't have gone forward with this investigation more quickly. They seem to be going forward with it very, very reluctantly. And uh, my guess is that it will be a, an equivocal uh, result and one in which one thing that you can, that I would feel confident of is that if Bill Casey had had the opportunity to delay the release of the hostages, he would have done it and he would have boasted about it because he would have elected a president by doing it. But I just don't see the contacts that would have enabled them to do it. Just watching the and seeing, you know, just the that I mean, there's an equally